I've got a creaky chair. Only creaky if you move. Welcome everybody, this is How To English, Teach and Learn with Gavin M. It's a podcast about teaching and learning English as a foreign language. All opinions stated are personal and references will be given when necessary. Time flies, Gav. It's that time again. Time flies when you're having fun. That's true, so that must be a good thing. We are back in the room. Ready to record. Back in the studio for episode studio, eight right, yeah. of Gavin M's How to English Pod. How's your tefling world, M? How's your tefling week? It's been lovely. I've had some really nice conversations with my students this week. A lot of them have been on holiday, so I've had some nice tours or virtual tours with photographs and lots of really fun descriptions of places. So you've been, they've been on holiday, they've returned and they've brought their photos into their classroom and said, teacher M and fellow students, let's have a look at this together. Yes, and one student was actually on holiday, so I didn't expect her to be there in the lesson. And she just phoned in to the team's call in the middle of a beautiful square in the middle of Italy and gave us a little panorama and said what she'd been up to. It was amazing. That is amazing. What cool students you've got. She said she was getting the messages up on the chat, so she thought she'd say hi. That's so sweet. Lovely. What about you, Gav? What's been your highlight this week? Em, I have had a very good week. There have been no issues as far as I can recall, so this is a very positive week. Lots of teaching and learning has happened. I think the highlight for me, Em, was early in the week, I had a catch-up lesson. What's a catch-up lesson? A catch-up lesson is a lesson that I organised because I missed the previous lesson. And I said to students from different groups, if you like, we can have a catch-up lesson to make up for the lesson that we lost the previous week. And then, to my surprise, they did. Nice. Well, I don't think that's such a surprise, Gav. I think they enjoy your lessons. They don't want to miss out. So it's a win-win, really. Win for you, win for them. But it makes your week a bit harder, I guess. It does. But it was really rewarding because, M, I had students from different groups in the same class. Oh, what a nice idea. Isn't that unusual? Have you ever had that before? No, but I do remember a company proposing it and I thought, yeah, that's interesting, just as a kind of drop in if you missed a lesson everyone's welcome it's a bit like fantasy football where you can choose all your favorite students from different groups and then put them all into one class it was so much fun that's fun em going back to your topic of holiday i thought we could talk about teaching and traveling today because i know you're a teaching and traveling teacher i am indeed i think the followers may have some questions Exactly. How do you do that, Em? So maybe I can ask you some questions and you can tell us, how do you teach and travel? Gav, that sounds like a great idea. Em, so break it down for us. How do you teach and travel? Because they're two opposite things. You can't be traveling and teaching, can you? Yes, indeed you can, Gav. In this day and age where the internet is at our tippy toes, no, at our fingertips, that's the one. At our fingertips and you can basically for the same price as living in the UK like a regular person paying rent or a mortgage you can travel around the world that is amazing you have to be a little bit selective obviously you couldn't just have a month in Monaco probably but you can select countries based on price budget I think budget is important. You have to set a limit because obviously there isn't an endless pot of money. There's a lot of considerations. I guess you've got to think about travel. Yeah, you've got to make sure you're in the right place at the right time and that you can get to your destination ready for your work week on Monday. So traveling at the weekend, trying to do some sightseeing during the week, maybe in the evenings. And of course, you need to think about your carbon footprint. You don't want to be flying everywhere. I don't, but I yeah, that's that's up to everyone to decide. But uh, public transport is fantastic in a lot of countries. You can get around by bus, by train, by ferry. It's 
challenging, but it's really rewarding. Em, do you need to speak the language of the country you're in in order to be able to travel through that country? Not necessarily, Gav. I think a lot of people speak English. So if you show maybe a little bit of willing to say hello and thank you, I think most people will understand. Well, of course, the internet translates everything anyway. So a lot of the websites you book through will give you the English version. So it's very easy in that respect. But I've not had any trouble. That is very interesting. So you've talked about travel, accommodation. Are there any other considerations that a teacher needs to think about before teaching and travelling? You will have to make sure you've got Wi-Fi because it'll all be online, I guess. So good internet connection. Check the booking before you go. Always check the reviews of the accommodation that you're staying at so that you know other people have connected. And what are you looking for in those reviews of the accommodation? I guess just bad internet or Wi-Fi doesn't work. Patchy connection. Something like that. Most of the time people just write excellent Wi-Fi, so that's always a good sign. That's very good. And possibly they have a dedicated workspace. So you need a table, a good chair and somewhere quiet so that you can teach online. Exactly. And that's it. That's all you need to think about. Pretty much, yeah. Enjoying the culture, going out and seeing life. It's always good. Make sure you have a little bit of free time so in the evenings you can wander around these new cities and see some museums, sample the cuisine, get a selfie with a statue. Yeah, because otherwise you're just in a building and that could be anywhere in the world. The reason you're doing it is to see things, I would suggest. Mm. That's the great thing about EFL, Gav. It is one of those jobs that you can take online and go anywhere. The world is yours. It's your oyster, as they say. Cool. I don't eat oysters, but yes, it's pretty cool. Em, thank you for explaining that. That is very, very interesting. I'm sure the followers found that quite fascinating. One of my students has come back after a long break, Gav. He's been away, he's been busy, and I've noticed he's actually better at English than he was when he left. Better? How do you mean? He seems more fluent, more confident, just making fewer errors. And I'm a little bit baffled because I thought it would be the opposite way around, that he would get all rusty and, you know, forget stuff. Has his break involved travelling to a foreign country where he was only speaking English? No. Is he now working with colleagues who only speak English? Nope. Oh, I don't know then. No, it's exactly what I was thinking. It's bizarre, but it's good. Well, isn't there that thing that if you sleep, <laughs> if you do an exercise and then you sleep, then that information may become knowledge? That's possible. Maybe it's all just cemented itself into his brain. So that long break was a bit like a sleep. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And his brain was dreaming about your English lessons, about the things that he learned, and then he returned and it was fixed, cemented. Yeah, yeah. or maybe he just forgot that he was nervous. Maybe he gets a bit anxious before lessons, but with the break, he's just gone back to kind of normal mode. I don't know. It was interesting. That is really interesting. I guess the lessons are a time where students are analysing language. They're breaking it down so it's not a fluent environment necessarily. A bit more analytical perhaps on a regular basis. Maybe it gets a bit habit forming that that's the mode he gets into. So maybe the break just uh, resets a little bit of everything. Yeah, I said to him, your English is amazing. And he looked a bit confused as well. (laughs) I think I would be baffled if somebody (laughs) said, stop doing that thing because you'll get better at it. Yeah. Yeah. So if our followers have got any ideas about this, I would love to get their opinions as well. I'm sure they've got opinions. If I think about it, um, I can also recall a student who missed a few lessons. And when they came back, they were also very, very good. And maybe it was that difference of fluency and confidence and they didn't have the doubt that may manifest itself during lessons Mm, yeah it's possible so can we suggest this for our students take a little break and come back possibly yeah it could be if they're feeling a little bit burnt out or overwhelmed maybe it's a good idea just to have a couple of weeks off Mm. 
And you'll come back twice as good. Maybe. Maybe not. <laughs> the uh, jury is still out on that one, I would mm. say. Em, have you noticed that your students don't use should for giving advice? Yes, now you mention it, that is a good point. It's unusual, isn't it? Because I often say, you should do this, you shouldn't do that. If your friend has a headache, you say, well, you should probably take some headache tablets as long as you're not allergic to them. Yeah, I think they say, maybe you can or maybe you need to. I don't think they even say that. I think they say, take headache tablets, go for a run, eat Mm. healthy food. Yeah, so has that been your focus this week, Gav? I have been talking to my students about giving advice. In fact, I think advice comes up very rarely in our lessons, Em. Well, it's a personal thing. I always broach this subject in the sort of lead-in to say, do you enjoy giving advice? What are the problems of giving advice? Why wouldn't you give advice? How do you feel about getting advice? Do you take the advice that you get given? I do all of that as well because... Some people don't like to give advice. It's a bit of a dangerous area sometimes, Mm. especially with business people, if they're not in a position to tell people what to do. So, Mm. yeah, I think it's an interesting topic, but I don't go about it in the formal sort of textbook way of, yeah, this is what you say if this happens. I always just try and get a bit of a a feel for it first with my students and what they would give advice about and in what situations. And do they think of examples? Do they remember some advice they've given recently? Well, that's another thing. It's quite a personal topic. If you're asking someone for advice, it's because you've got doubts and that's usually something quite serious. So I tend to get their opinion about giving advice and then I choose a very neutral topic like where should I go on holiday or recommendations for films and books because it doesn't have to be like medical advice or something like that. That does cross over. You're right. It doesn't have to be what would I do if I had this problem, but also can you suggest something that I might enjoy? Yeah, exactly. So what have you been doing? Well, um, I've got a worksheet, which maybe we will come back to later. We could try that for our quiz of the week. But as I like to give a little mini lesson to my students and not interrupt too much of the flow of the lesson, I've taken a few sentences from one of my favourite books, which is called 700 Classroom Activities. Yes, I know that one. That's the one from Macmillan, isn't it? It is, and I absolutely love it. And what they suggest is you read to your students some sentence starters and they can simply complete them for you. Nice. Should we have a quick go? Yeah. Em, if I said to you, to be happy in life... You should do what you want to do. (laughs) I like that. I'm (laughs) definitely going to take that advice. (laughs) To learn a new language. You should get a good teacher. Mm, And possibly a good book. Yep. To not annoy your neighbour. To not annoy your (laughs) neighbour. You should keep the noise down after 10 (laughs) o'clock. Good. And the last one, to enjoy the weekend more? You should find a friend group and go out skating. Oh, I like that suggestion. That was nice. It automatically led to things being generated, which wasn't too difficult. So I knew what I wanted to say. I just needed to work out how I was going to say it, which I think is half the job done, really, with that kind of thing. You're not asking them to come up with an idea like, yeah, I've got this problem, what should I do? You're giving them half the answer already. It's nice, I like that. Thanks. Gav, it must be time for a break. Sure, all this teaching and learning is exhausting. I'll put on the kettle. Followers, if you enjoy listening to our podcast, watching our show on YouTube or reading the transcription on our website, Show your support by visiting coffee.com, ko-fi.com forward slash how to English pod. And get us a coffee to show your appreciation. Links in our show notes. Gav, I've got one of these what would Gav do questions for you. What would Gav do? What would Gav do? Let's find out. I'll consult Gav. What's this situation you're facing, M? Right, we're practicing indirect questions in the lesson. So I've already taught the grammar. 
So students know things like, could you tell me what the time is, please? Instead of what is the time, yeah? So we've got a set of direct questions on the page I'm sharing on my Teams meeting. There are four students and they're taking turns to make the direct question indirect and they're asking each other the question. And where did these questions come from? English file. Oh, <laughs> you could write your own, Em. You could, but it's all there in English file. It's great. And which book is that? I will give you the page, Gav. You can put it in the show notes if anyone needs a page for indirect questions. It's very easy. But you can actually pick any question sheet and make them indirect. You could even write your own. You could. You could if you want to. So we're going through the questions. I can see that there's a student that's a little bit distracted. And she basically asked directly after another student exactly the same question. Exactly the same question? Yeah, so she chose the same question, oh, transformed no. it to indirect, and then asked exactly the same question to exactly the same student, which was spooky. <laughs> and I, in that moment, had to make a decision. And everyone was laughing. And she didn't understand why. Gav, what would you do? I would say, student B just asked that question. Yes, I said that and it was a little bit awkward because obviously they felt that was embarrassing. Well, I would not wait for too long for them to feel uncomfortable. I'd simply say, you did that very well. That was a great transformation into indirect. Now I want you to choose another sentence and ask a different student. Yeah, I did that too. But then after the lesson, I thought... Mm. What I didn't do was actually give that student the answer because they actually wanted to know the answer, but they, I suppose as punishment, lost out on that because they weren't paying attention the first time. Because the other three clearly don't want to listen again to the answer and I didn't want to labour it, so I just moved on quickly. But I thought, oh, maybe that was a missed opportunity because they were genuinely interested. Well, then you're right. Maybe you should have said, student B said this. Yep. And then ask student yep. A to ask a different question to a different student yep. and then continue that way. But in the moment, it's like you have to make a decision. And I thought, no, we're not going to go over this again. We've already talked about it. How did you know the student really wanted to know the answer? Because it sounds like they were not particularly engaged <laughs> and they were simply um, picking one sentence and transforming I don't, it. I don't. You're right. I don't. I guess I'm just trying to cover all the bases. I'm trying to cover all the options. But yeah, the other issue with that is I was doing this at the end of a long lesson. We'd done a lot of control practice and this was the free practice. and We only had 15 minutes and I really wanted them to get a lot of practice with the questions. And one of them also answered the question in a way that sounded like they were going to tell a story. Mm. And Gav, what would you do in that situation? You've got four students, you want to practice the grammar and one student Cut starts to launch... Right, good, well demonstrated. Cut them off straight away and then say, oh, well, that's really interesting. We'll come back to your story later. I did that too. And it'll be very later because it'll be the next lesson. That's what I said. If I remember. I said, I'm going to make a note and we'll come back to your story because it sounds amazing and it actually did sound really interesting. But I thought that's the end of the lesson. If this student tells the story, we're going to just listen and that's the end and it's really hard to to stop that person talking because that is our ultimate goal isn't it we want our students to talk but well the ultimate goal is that everybody talks not just yeah. one student and also practice the language we were focusing on so yeah so it was semi-controlled practice then well it was free practice in the sense of i had a bit of a time limit for semi free each. practice well, I'd call that, would it, that not free? I think it's just free because you don't know what they're going to say and it's up to them to answer. Well, if you're cutting them off and saying, that's <laughs> enough of that answer, thank you, I want the next person. And just before we switch the topic, I want to stay with that group because I remembered something else that happened. We started the lesson, there should have been five, there were only four, and one of them gave me an excuse for the student that wasn't coming. And I was in teacher mode at this point, thinking, okay, you're really going to stomp on these errors. She was explaining to me the reason why the student couldn't attend. So she said to me, she can't come because she's been to the doctor and she had to wait a long time in the waiting room. And he also said... He? The student? Or he the doctor? The doctor. But I kind of jumped in and said, he? Don't you mean she? And it was all a bit ugh, weird. But mm. this is my issue with error correction. Sometimes I do jump the gun a bit and I should just listen. 
And I always struggle to know which one's right. Should you just quickly jump in and correct the errors that seem easy? But that's a good example of a time when I was actually wrong and I should have just waited. Yeah, you were. Yeah. <laughs> but that's, I just want to point that out because sometimes it's worth just hearing the sentence and waiting because it's not always wrong. I do wonder if the students are also following because their mm. faces are often very blank. Other students, you mean? The other students in the class, whether they're following mm. the conversation or the story because I can't really read them. And I don't know if they're thinking of something else or if they're enjoying the story that the other student's talking about. I just don't know. Well, I think that beginning part of the lesson where there's just kind of catch up and excuse people because they're not coming or whatever the reason, you know, I need to go because I've got a meeting. Some students just don't listen to any of that. They just switch off. Really? Sometimes. And I think How it's... do you know that, Em? Because they might say, where's so-and-so? And, you know, it's like, well, weren't you just listening? It was, we talked about it, you know, they're at the doctor. But mm. um, I think they just tune out. Because maybe they're busy or maybe they're just not quite ready for the lesson mm -hmm. or it might be just too hard. So if you could incorporate the language, the correct English into any part of the lesson, that's why I try and make everything about make it sound good, mm -hmm. you know, get it right. And really clear as well. It's very hard to tell a story. And if you're jumping back and forth between the characters or the people yeah. and he and she, yeah, sometimes it's best to say the doctor or... yeah our colleague and then use their name or whatever. That's right. So it's a balance, as usual, of these things. And often my students are not great with their pronouns. They might start mm. by saying, my wife went to the shops yesterday and he bought a yeah. new packet of, and I'm saying he, she, he, yeah. she, where, where, who, who is this now? Small things, but they're really important things. And this is what they're going to have to do in life, you know, if they start a meeting and they have to excuse someone, it's going to have to be clear. So I think these parts of lessons are actually really vital to get right because the information is really important. You have to be quite precise. But this is where error correction gets a bit difficult because if you wait for delayed error correction in that situation, nobody's going to remember if they said he or she at the right time. So that's why you've got to get in there quickly and, and correct that student. But, you know... If they're actually right, you're messing up the story. Mm. And you don't want to upset the student too much by interrupting the story because this might be, in their mind, something outside of the lesson. Serious stuff. They're not practising English at this point. They're just informing the teacher yeah. of something important. Yeah, it's a very delicate business. Tefl business. It's a very delicate business of error correction, I think. So at this point of the episode, M which is kind of mirroring what might happen in one of my lessons, I say to the students, would you like to do this activity, A, and then I describe it to them, mm. or this activity, B, which I might describe to them. So you mean you've done about 30 minutes of chat, catching up, what's been going on this week, and then you get into the meat of your lesson, and you've got, you've got options, have you? Okay, that's very good. I usually say, right, this is what we're doing today. But you've got a selection box, like a Christmas chocolate box selection. Yes. Yes, exactly. So your choice is, M. would you like to return to the very first topic that we covered, which was about teaching and travelling? Or would you like to have a look at some giving advice? I would prefer to do giving advice, I think. Right. So we'll save my travel quiz, which I'm very, very excited about, for next time, Em. Let's not forget. Okay. In that case, it's time for... Quiz, quiz of, of the week. week! Em, I've got nine pieces of advice. Advice is not countable, is it? It's not, Gav. It's like a cake. You take a piece of advice. That's it. Or some advice. Yes. Mm. I've got nine of them. What I'm going to do is read the advice to you. And I want you to guess exactly what the problem was that I'm responding to. OK, that sounds like fun. And at the end of the exercise, Em, I want you to tell us exactly what we have practised. Right, OK. Now, my first piece of advice. I can see your eyes are welling up. I need to give you this advice to make you feel happy about the world again. And simply I say to you, I think you should take it back to the shop and get a bigger one. 
<laughs> what was your problem that I'm giving you the advice for? Well, I would say I bought a new teacup and <laughs> it's just not going to hold enough tea. Is it only the size of a thimble? Yeah, it's like a thimble. One gulp and it's gone, Gav. That's completely useless because I know, Em, that you like your tea. In a bucket. <laughs> yes, basically a bucket with a handle. <laughs> so I think your advice is good and I agree. I am going to go back to the shop and I'm going to get a bigger one. I hope you've kept the receipt. Somewhere in a drawer, yeah. Great. I hope you enjoy your new cup. <laughs> em, you look really perplexed. Number two, I need to give you this advice and it's, have you considered changing the settings? Right. I'm guessing it's something technical, Gab. So I would say something like, yeah, I've got every time I start my lessons, I've got love heart rain coming down on my screen and my students are looking at me like, what are you doing? Mm, it's not Valentine's Day, is it? No, no. But maybe it was some time ago and I pressed something, but now it's just there all the time. So you need to seriously think about those settings. Go in yeah. there. Three dots drop down next to your profile picture usually that's it yeah get to that background or whatever it is emoji settings i think rainbows would be better or <laughs> nothing just possibly nothing clouds no no oh. nothing we're professional people but good advice thank you yeah i will check the settings you're welcome now you look a bit lost em and i say to you number three whatever you do remember to go after 3 p.m <laughs> uh I'm going to say I'm probably in a country where they have a siesta and the shops don't open until the afternoon. So thanks for that advice. I will remember to go after 3 p.m. I have plenty of experience of this and I'm very happy to share it with you, Em. Thanks, Gav. Number four, you'd better ask for a second opinion. Oh, this could be quite a serious one. So maybe there's a medical issue or... I'm not sure if what my doctor said was right. So I think I'm going to, yeah, go to a different doctor. I'm very happy to give you that advice. Now, I often give this advice to my students, to my colleagues, fellow teachers. M, number five, what about switching it off and on again? Classic, classic. Computer, TV, anything really with an on button if it's not working. Switch it off and on again. It always works, doesn't it? Nine times out of ten, yeah. Of course, number six, it might be a good idea to ask your colleague. Maybe I'm, I'm learning a new skill and I'm not sure what to do in this situation. Because we all know somebody who knows something better than we do. Yeah, so maybe I just don't know how to use Excel or something. Um, you will excel. <laughs> if I ask a colleague, if I ask the right <laughs> colleague, I guess. Number seven. If I were you, I'd improve your English first. Okay. Maybe I need to give a presentation in front of a lot of people and I'm not very confident with what I'm talking about. I think my English is okay, to be honest. But yeah, I mean, it could always be better. Mm, well, we are role playing, Em. Let's not forget. Right. So if I was a student learning English, then that would be applicable. That would be a great piece of advice, wouldn't it? Yeah. So it could be anything from yeah going on holiday to an English speaking country or something like that. Um, you could always try dying it, number eight. Dying it as an action, dying it. Yeah, to die as in to colour, not as in to kick the bucket. Aha. Uh -huh. So I guess I've just come back from the hairdressers and I'm not happy with my new pink hair perhaps and you say you could always try dyeing it back to brown or whatever absolutely it could also be that saturday night remember when you were sitting on the sofa with that very large glass of red wine and whoops <laughs> i think you might need to dye the sofa covers. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> i think that could be quite a challenging job but yes you could just dye it all red <laughs> now, I think the best piece of advice for M, number nine, why don't you have a nice cup of tea and put your feet up? Oh, I like that one with my new big cup. That basically is the answer to every problem in the world. It doesn't matter if it's big or small. The answer is always have a nice cup of tea and put your feet up. I absolutely agree. That is very nice advice. Now, I would probably 
share this document with you as you're the student. Yeah. And you might notice that I have underlined some of the key language for giving advice. Yeah. Do you think you could just quickly read those lines back to us, the giving advice lines? Okay, sure. I'm looking at the page you've underlined. I think you should. Have you thought about or have you considered? Whatever you do, you'd better, which is you had better. What about, it might be a good idea to, if I were you, I'd, you could always try and why don't you? Wow, you said all of those, did you? I did. <laughs> and they are very, very useful for giving advice. So you don't simply need to say you should or yeah. shouldn't. And you could always, ask, <laughs> there you go, advice. You could always ask your students to tell you how many they remember. But to be honest, I wasn't really paying attention to the language. I was just listening and understanding the problem. So it's nice to reflect on that after the exercise. You know, what, what was the language I used? If your students just say you should, you should, you should, that's okay. But you can also give them the extra phrases and say, well, these are also possible. That's it. Feed that language in there and say, oh, yeah, if I were you, mm. I'd consider doing this. Nice, nice exercise. I liked it. Thank you. All right, Em. Now I'm done giving advice, and I think our followers are a lot more knowledgeable on how to teach and travel. And we will come back to that subject in the future. Because it's a nice topic. Enjoy your travels, Em. I'll see you at the next stop. Yes, Gav, see you then. Mm -hmm.